What is everything made of? What is that basic building material from which all matter of our universe and all its diversity is made? The idea that such a building material, the primary basis of all matter, must exist, came to people's minds already in ancient times. For example, already in the 6th century before our era, the ancient Greek philosopher Empedocles proposed the idea that all bodies are combinations of four primary elements, water, earth, fire, and air. Their mixture in different proportions gives substances their physical and chemical properties. The ideas of Empedocles about the primary elements were taken up and developed by such giants of philosophy as Plato and Aristotle. There was another opinion. The philosophers Leucippus and Democritus put forward the idea that all bodies consist of tiny indivisible particles, atoms, which differ from one another by their shape and other properties. The atoms of solid bodies, they said, are rough and hooked and therefore cling well to one another, which makes solid solid. Meanwhile, the atoms of liquids are round and smooth, which gives liquids their fluidity. Leucippus and Democritus did not recognize any primary elements. There are only many atoms of different shapes and the void between them. We know for certain that Leucippus and Democritus were right and that all material bodies consist of molecules and molecules of atoms. But unlike Leucippus, Democritus, and the physicists of the 17th and 18th centuries, we do not consider atoms to be primary and indivisible elements of matter. We know that atoms have an internal structure, a massive nucleus of positively charged protons and uncharged neutrons, as well as light electrons on the periphery. Moreover, we know that the protons and neutrons of the atomic nucleus also have an internal structure, consisting of quarks. And here, our journey into the depth of matter seems to end. Quarks, just like electrons, are considered structureless building blocks of matter, what physicists call elementary particles. It might seem, then, that everything is finally clear. Matter consists of quarks, which form protons and neutrons. These form atomic nuclei, which are at the centers of atoms. Atoms form molecules, and molecules form everything. Alas, the universe is arranged in a much stranger way and turns out to be something far more interesting than just a set of elementary particles. A classical example that suggests this is the beta decay of a neutron, in which it transforms into a proton, an electron, and an electron antineutrino. It is quite logical to assume that this happens because the neutron contains an electron inside itself. But we know for certain that this is not the case. If it were so, then for the reverse transformation of a proton into a neutron, the proton would need to absorb an electron to restore its integrity. And such a process, by the way, is indeed possible. However, alongside it, there exists another process, inverse beta decay, during which a proton turns into a neutron without any absorption of an electron. On the contrary, in this process, an antiparticle of the electron is released. This means that inside the neutron, there is no electron, just as inside the proton there is no positron. These particles appear, are created directly in the course of the reaction. We literally and regularly observe how particles emerge out of nowhere and disappear into nowhere. In the presence of significant energy, such as the energy of an electromagnetic field, there occurs the phenomenon of pair creation of a particle and an antiparticle. In other situations, particle-antiparticle pairs, on the contrary, annihilate, turning into energy we say that a proton consists of three quarks. However, in reality, everything inside happens much more complexly. Chaotic processes of creation of quark-antiquark pairs and their annihilation go on constantly. At every moment of time, the proton can contain many different quarks and antiquarks. Only the number of d-quarks will always be one greater than the number of d-antiquarks, while the number of u-quarks will always be two greater than the number of u-antiquarks. And this is precisely what physicists mean when they say that there are on average three quarks in a proton. That is, elementary particles are not something constant and stable. They emerge, disappear, transform into one another, and so on, all the while obeying certain laws, such as, for example, the law of conservation of electric charge. This means they are not well suited for the role of the primary basis of everything. It is obvious that there must exist another, deeper level of reality, the processes of which we perceive as elementary particles. One of the first to propose the existence of such a deeper layer of reality was one of the fathers of quantum mechanics, Paul Dirac. 
the man who first mathematically proved the existence of antiparticles even before they were experimentally discovered. To explain the concept of antiparticles, pair creation, and their annihilation, Dirac proposed an interesting idea known as the Dirac C. Dirac suggested that, in addition to the observable world of particles with positive energies, including positive masses, there exists an invisible multitude of particles with negative energies. These form that very C. In this C, according to Dirac, particles are represented with all possible energies and momenta. They are packed so densely that no physical processes are possible there. For this reason, the C is inaccessible to our direct observations and cannot be detected by us in any way. But if, said Dirac, we impart some energy to the Dirac C, then one of its particles will acquire positive energy. It will as if be thrown out of the Dirac C and will then be able to participate in various physical processes, thus becoming observable. On the other hand, in the Dirac C itself, there will appear an empty, vacant place. The Dirac C will as if come into motion, which from our point of view will look like the appearance in observable reality, an antiparticle. This is the very process we observe as pair creation. The reverse process is also possible. A particle can return to its place in the Dirac C, releasing the energy given to it. Annihilation occurs. Today, the concept of the Dirac C is not used in modern physics. We do not consider antiparticles to be quasi-particles with negative energy, as Dirac did. From the point of view of most processes in our universe, particles and antiparticles are completely equal and equivalent, equally real, or equally unreal if we are speaking about virtual particles and antiparticles. Therefore, the Dirac C was soon rejected by physicists. Yet this mysterious and romantically sounding name often inspires science fiction authors. The very concept of some kind of entity that does not manifest itself directly in most situations, but is the primary cause of observable phenomena, later received fruitful development in the form of the so-called quantum field theory. According to it, what we perceive as particles are nothing more than states, excited states, of the so-called material fields. The electron is an excitation of the lepton field. The proton and the neutron are excitations of the hadron field, and so on. These fields are always present everywhere, as if permeating our universe. The absence of particles corresponds to the state when these fields are unperturbed, like the smooth surface of water. By imparting energy to a material field in one way or another, we generate a disturbance in the same way that a stone thrown into water generates waves. And these waves in the material fields, invisible to us in their ground state, are what we interpret as particles. For instance, the energy of the electromagnetic field whose excitations are photons, can be transferred to the lepton field, leading to the creation of an excitation of that field, which we perceive as an electron-positron pair. Later, these two excitations may mutually cancel one another, and the field will again return to its unperturbed state. The energy spent on creating the excitations will be released. The concept of material fields and their excitations allows one to describe very precisely all or nearly all observable phenomena. The concept that the entire world we observe is nothing but a way of exciting these fields is today generally accepted in modern physics. However, in our present search for the fundamental basis of the material world, this concept certainly cannot be the final stop. After all, a field is, first of all, a mathematical object, a distribution in space of the values of some physical quantity. For example, we can define a field of temperatures on the surface of the earth, or even a field of prices for potatoes. Put simply, when we speak of a field, we must always specify of which quantity we are speaking. In the case of the fields responsible for the appearance of elementary particles, we are speaking of probability fields, more precisely, of the probability density of finding a particle in a given volume of space. To be still more precise, we are speaking of the spatial distribution of the so-called wave function, a quantity whose square gives us the probability density of detecting the particle. And here a problem arises. Probability, probability density, and even more so the wave function are not material. More precisely, as physicists say, they are not observable physical characteristics, meaning there exists no device or experimental method that would allow us to measure or to directly sense the wave function of an electron or of any other quantum particle. An experiment can only give us an answer to the question of whether a particle is present in a given region of space or not. 
but we cannot in any way state what the probability of finding the particle was before we began looking for it at all. For example, we may find that the particle is not here. Yet such a result could be observed in the case when the probability of finding the particle was equal to 0%, or 10%, or 50%, or even 99.99%. It is simply that in this particular experiment, we were unlucky in detecting it. We may study the behavior of other such particles in the same situation, and after many experiments, make certain conclusions about what that probability actually was. However, for one single specific particle, the wave function, though it determines its physical behavior, remains for us a mystery. In other words, we are unable to directly determine the state of the corresponding material field. We cannot touch it in the same way as we can touch, for example, the field of temperatures on the surface of the Earth with the help of a simple thermometer. In this sense, the material fields of quantum field theory turn out to be even less material and more abstract than the usual mathematical fields of classical physics. But how can something so immaterial and abstract be the primary foundation of everything? How can we impart energy to an abstraction? Therefore, it is obvious that material fields alone are apparently not the full story. It seems that in nature there is something else, and that the material fields describe the state of this something. Physicists even have an answer to the question of what this mysterious something is. According to modern understanding, it is nothing other than the physical vacuum itself. This, of course, sounds extremely strange. We are accustomed to thinking that vacuum is nothing, emptiness, the absence of anything at all. So how can emptiness be the primary foundation of everything? However, in reality, modern physics provides ample evidence that vacuum is far from being simply emptiness. One of the most well-known experiments of this kind is the famous Casimir effect, in which two plates placed very close to one another in vacuum experience an anomalous attraction toward each other. This is explained by the fact that vacuum turns out to be capable of generating virtual photons which press upon the plates in the same way as molecules of gases press upon bodies placed into those gases. Yet, according to the laws of electrodynamics, in the space between the plates, fewer photons should be generated than in the space outside them. Because of this, the photon pressure outside turns out to be greater. However, these are not real photons, but virtual ones, essentially born out of vacuum for the briefest of instants. Too fleeting for us to be able to register them, that is, in a certain sense, in the Casimir effect, the plates are squeezed by the pressure of the vacuum itself, which the vacuum simply should not have possessed if it were ordinary emptiness. The interaction of vacuum with ordinary material objects also generates other effects, such as the Lamb shift of atomic energy levels, and so forth. It is quite possible that it is precisely the materiality of the physical vacuum that provides for the accelerated expansion of the universe. According to this theory, the vacuum must even possess mass. Its equivalent density should be on the order of 10 to the power of minus 27 kilograms per cubic meter. And since we now know for certain that vacuum is not simply the absence of anything, it practically suggests itself for the role of that very primary foundation of matter. Of course, one should not confuse the concept of the physical vacuum with the still popular in certain circles, although long ago refuted by modern science, theories of ether and similar ideas. The vacuum is not a material medium in the classical sense of the word, and elementary particles are not condensations of vacuum, similar to condensations of ether in ether theories. The relationships between the vacuum and the world of observable and even unobservable, particles are far more complex. Particles are not a form of existence of the vacuum. They are the result of disturbances of the vacuum caused by imparting energy to it in one way or another. This is similar to how music is nothing but disturbances of the density of air created by the playing of musical instruments. Air is the carrier of music, and without it, no music can exist. Yet you cannot scoop out some volume of air and expect that you will also place music into the vessel together with it. Within this analogy, the observable world can be compared to the play of light ripples at the bottom of a pond, created by the refraction of light at the water's surface. In just the same way, the vacuum refracts energy, and the result is elementary particles, their complexes, and ultimately material bodies and the entire world around us. 
And although the idea that all of us are nothing but the refraction of energy by emptiness does not sound especially encouraging, the universe, as I very much like to say, is under no obligation to be the way we would like it to be. In our next videos, we will certainly continue to study how strangely and sometimes paradoxically our world is arranged. And if you enjoy what happens on our channel, then I invite you to support its work by becoming a sponsor here on YouTube or on our pages at Patreon and Boosty. A link to the latter should now appear on your screens. Well, that is all for today. All the best to you, dear friends, and see you again in our upcoming videos.